So let's uh, go ahead and have uh, Zach from Foodie come up and uh, start sharing what he has to share with us. All right. Well, uh, I'm Zach. I'm with Foodie. Um, it's good to be here. I think it's kind of uh, just a, maybe a quick shout out to One Million Cups. I can't. I started coming to One Million Cups maybe like a year and a half, almost two years ago. Um, I was really interested in doing something with a software company, but I didn't um, didn't know how to code, and I didn't really have any good ideas. So I just started coming to this and uh, kind of hanging out with people and trying to learn, and it was been really helpful. Uh, it's been a really good experience, so it's kind of fun to be on the other side of this. Um, but um, so we are a uh, we we're a like a marketplace that connects restaurants and Instagram influencers. Um, and the idea is that it all works on trade, um, so that you can exchange advertising and exposure for free food at your restaurant, right? Um, and, uh, come on. Whoa. Okay, that's cool. Um, so I'll just go through this quickly. So this is kind of how it works, right? You can, you log in as a, as a restaurant, you can see all sorts of influencers near you, um, and sort it by various factors, um, and you can see someone's profile, what their followers and engagement. We have r reviews so that restaurants um, can, you know, let other restaurants know how how influencers worked with worked with them, um, and then you send them a request, um, which just allows you to exchange food at your restaurant for. Uh, specific deliverables on Instagram, right? So say maybe you want a a post with your restaurant tagged, or you want a few stories. You can say all that there, and and the date you want them to come. So the idea is just to keep it super simple, super streamlined, um, and fast. We, um, you know, we, we my co-founder and I did this because uh, both of us did a lot of stuff as Instagram influencers. Um, and we actually went to, him and I went to Bali for a while, and we were working with some other companies, and we just wanted free food. And so we uh, decided to start talking to some restaurants, and we just would drive around on a moped through the city and try and like write down all the restaurants we could find, and then we'd go find them on Instagram and message them. And it worked really well, and we ate for free like every day. And we're like, wow, this is awesome, but it you know it took quite a few hours to like get all this information and and solidify a deal that was worth that was you know worth like a bowl of soup and um that wasn't really like worth your time at the end of the day and so we, we knew that restaurants really liked it and we knew that we really liked it there just needed to be like a faster and easier way to do this um so that's why we we made this um and then oh i didn't finish this after after you send a request you start a little message thing and that uh and then you can work out the details. Um, and then this is actually my uh, my co-founder here. He kind of posed as not one of the founders and, and just uh, messaging restaurants as an influencer and uh, was able to do a collaboration with someone. And here's a picture of him um, after he did that. Um, so there's us. Here, so here's... Um, I don't know if you can read this, but the, probably the only important thing on this slide is this bottom chart here um, that shows that the influencer marketing uh, industry is something that's growing rapidly, um, in you know, doubling almost in uh, or more than doubling in in two years. Um, so there's you know it used to be kind of like a cute little thing, but now it's definitely becoming a, a serious thing that a lot of people are using and that a lot of uh, uh, industries have to kind of take seriously. And restaurants is definitely one of those. Um, you can see here, this is a really, I, I think, a helpful chart. If you look at America, 82% of restaurant owners invest money in something related to social media, right? That's kind of like, um, I think, a metric that surprises most people, right? Because most people see this and they're like, oh, restaurants aren't going to pay for that. It's like, well, they pay for a lot of stuff. Um, related to social media. And if you think about like in 2019, how you market your restaurant, um, it, it can be really hard. And, uh, and social media is, is a pretty cheap way to get in front of a lot of people. Um, okay, here's the question that 
a lot of you maybe have, right? Well, restaurants use this. Um, here's, a, here's a little case study that we did. Um, so the first question is, do restaurants even work with influencers, right? Is this a thing? Um, and so we, were in, we went to Chicago and we contacted a bunch of restaurants um, just as like from an influencer angle, right? And just asking them like, hey, can we come by and we'll share something about you on our Instagram account if you let us eat for free. All we did was send a message on Instagram. Um, we contacted 83 restaurants. Of those 83, 24 said yes, five said no, and 54 didn't respond. Um, and a lot of the times, you know, those messages are going to just someone on, you know, maybe like some high schooler that's managing the account and doesn't really care about your message and ignores it. So, you know, if you're able to contact people in a, in a better way, we think we could get that number even higher. But even still, 24 out of 83 was, was pretty impressive to us that that many people um, are open and willing to have influencers come over for a free meal. Um, next, uh, the next question we wanted to solve is: Do restaurants actually will they actually like pay for this service, right? And and above and beyond just giving free food to the influencer, well, is there will they be willing to put some money in there? Um, so we tracked on this person. I'm realizing we spelled her handle wrong, but it's Chicago Food Authority. Um, and she, all she does is restaurants in Chicago um, on, on Instagram, right? And she goes and she works with maybe four or five restaurants per week. And uh, we found out she charges $800 per post, right? For one post, 800 bucks. Uh, she has around, you know, around 150, 200,000 followers. Um, and uh, it's a really impressive, right, that you're going to restaurants, you know, and that's just in Chicago, four or five restaurants per week in Chicago are inviting her over at 800 bucks a post to eat for free and post one picture on her Instagram. Um, so there's, there's, there's a lot of value there of, uh, um, you know, we hope to tap into. Um, the next question, right, will influencers use this? And, you know, we, we have maybe not the best data on this, but I except for ourselves that we knew we really liked to eat for free and we were pretty confident that we were uh you know the average influencer um but uh you know one way that we kind of measure this is we uh we we've built out some kind of some scraping schemes and and where we get um where we'll get emails for influencers and we and we send out blasts and uh it's really interesting to us to see just measure the numbers on that, and our when we're when we're contacting influencers, our click rates are oftentimes above industry open rates. Um, so just you know the idea, you know, just an email that talks about how you can get free food was very intriguing to uh, to influencers, and we were able to get a lot of people signed up through this method. Um, and why? Because you know people like to people like to eat for people like to eat for free. Um, I think something. Maybe I mentioned on here is that, you know it's it's really similar to kind of an old something that's happened in business for a very long time right where you want to you invite someone out to lunch and you go you know you buy them lunch and then they help you out right that's something that's that's common in a lot of industries and this is essentially kind of that same thing right people like to go and they eat for free and but instead of maybe providing you feedback on your business or help getting a job they're just giving you advertising and marketing. Um, and, uh, and so it's great, you know, if you can, and you know, a, a meal is, is relatively cheap. The average influencer on our platform has about 40,000 followers. I think it's up to like 42,000 right now. Um, and so, you know, for, for the price of a sandwich, you can get in front of, um, a lot of people, right? You work with 10, 20 of those people a month. Um, you're getting in front of a lot of people for much cheaper than if you were to run Facebook ads or Google ads or, or any other way of getting in front of 200,000 people, you know? Um, okay. This isn't working. Can you get me the next slide maybe? I don't know why this isn't clicking for me. There we go. Um, these are some, so we're, you know, we feel like we're pretty new in this space. There's a few people trying to do something similar, um, but this process we feel like is one that hasn't really been perfected yet. There's a few companies 
um, that have done it. Many of you maybe are familiar with local fluence. They do something kind of, and, and we, we actually are pretty different in, we, in that we uh, kind of how we operate. They work with really small people and um, kind of have kind of have a different mission. But um, um, but yeah, we're pretty new here. There's there's only a few people that have, have are trying to do this, and most of them have been really successful. Um, it looks like that's it. So there we go. <laughs> So yeah, we got some questions. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, oh, we charge a monthly fee for restaurants to be on the platform. Um, we're kind of playing with it right now. It'll it'll probably land at around 100 bucks a month. Right now, we're charging 50 bucks a month. We just we just kind of launched a beta version. We're charging for yeah. Right. Yeah. And they don't pay a fee to any of the influencers, so there's no, uh, you know, we don't tap into any exchange of that at all. Yeah. Do you have a yeah. way to track results? I know Facebook, you can see how many people click through an ad, um, whereas things like billboards or it sounds like maybe this, um, it's kind of a leap of faith to know what your results are. Do you have anything, any plans to do yeah. that? Yeah, Th that's a good, it's a good question, and it's definitely, um, yeah, an important one because it is difficult to track um, some of this like more organic like influencer stuff, and it, and that's a problem across you know the whole industry, right? Um, we we've talked to some companies that we may partner with just to try and like track like traffic in the door and kind of line that up with your with your campaigns, um, but at the end of the day, it's still like not a perfect solution, and. You know, one of the things that we just uh, have realized, though, is that our our bread and butter customer is someone that already believes in the idea of influencer marketing and just kind of has realized the the value that there's that there's ROI for them there, right? Um, it's it's hard for us to sell if you really don't understand or believe in the idea of influencer marketing. It's difficult for us to sell you on a platform that makes that easier, you know. Um, so we kind of just try to like, you know, you kind of have to figure that out on your own and, and if you like it we can we can make it a lot easier and cheaper for you yeah uh, geographically I mean restaurants really depend on them being part of a specific geographic location I mean I'm not going to travel you know 15 20 miles to go get something to eat on the on the go do you have some kind of data that supports the demographic of these influencers so that restaurants can make educated decisions on who would be the best influencer for them yeah, so we um, we get everyone's location, um, so that you only work with with people that are based near you. Um, even still, um, if you have a large following, a lot of those people are probably not in that city, you know. Um, but what we found is that that's actually not as big a deal for restaurants as you might think. Um, especially in, uh, you know, we, we found this especially in, in bigger cities and places where there's lots of people coming to and from, um, that, uh, that having like a name that's recognized wide, you know, at least like nationwide is something that's really helpful for, for these people and brings a lot of new, a lot of new customers when they, when they travel to a new place. And, um, especially, you know, in, in Bali or Chicago, some of these like bigger places, there would be, uh, um, restaurants would survive almost solely off of, Instagram marketing and, and people with followers in different countries even um, or that were predominantly in different countries would bring in you know revenue for the for these restaurants because there's just people traveling a lot and uh, and it was just helpful for them to have their name spread at, at a wide reach like that We don't we don't currently pull that data, but um, but yeah, maybe that that's something interesting to to look at. Maybe we could we could pull that for sure. Great job presenting. Oh, thanks. Um, the question that comes to mind uh, to me is how do you deal or how do the influencers deal with the soft money aspect of it? Like how you know because they're getting something, so they're getting something of monetary value, and so uh, they would then have to be taxed on 
that value that they got, whether that's free food or something. You know. So if they're doing that regularly and they're eating something, it has a monetary value, so they're getting something and would therefore need to be taxed, which I believe would be called soft money. So that would be the only thing that comes to mind. I love your concept. I just don't know like if that gets sticky or if there's a solution for that or something. Yeah, I think I think it's a good question. There's you know, there's that's that's a, a question. There's also like, you know, FTC guidelines now about like declaring whether something's a, you know, an advertisement if you're getting paid for it. And it's like, well, if you're not getting paid, but you are receiving this something worth, you know, worth money, um, and it does get a little a little, you know, it, it it's it's kind of a new um, industry, and the, and the rules on this are are new, and it's it's a little bit gray sometimes when it comes to. Um, things that you're not actually trading money on. Um, at the end of the day, though, the responsibility is between the influencer and the restaurant, right? Um, and so we'll certainly build in things to encourage people to, to follow those rules. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, that the influencers, are they're working with several brands. They, they're not, most of the time, this isn't the first time they've, they've done a collaboration of this sort, and, and uh, the responsibility to handle that collaboration legally, you know, is kind of on them, you know. So just so that you can confirm to me, I think this is what I understand, but when an, if I'm an influencer and I can charge $800 for a post, then it seems like I'd be devaluing myself if I'm just going in for a free meal. So it seems like to me, there's a lot of value for the restaurant to give a Twelve fifteen dollar lunch, um, but if if I'm a big enough influencer, then that doesn't do much for me. Um, and so it seems like it's it's kind of based or or modeled for people who are trying to build their their followers um, and don't have a lot of following, because then there's some value for them. But if I'm big enough, then I, you know, I'm foregoing eight hundred dollars for for a lunch. Is that Am I understanding that correctly? So I, um, I think there's two aspects to that. And one is that um, the influencer game is changing pretty fast. There's a lot of people entering. Um, and there's just a lot of influencers. Out. There's a lot of people on Instagram that have 40,000 followers. And, and um, so just like supply and demand, like you are, you, you know, in order to charge money nowadays, you really have to like out compete pretty hard. And, um, and so that price is just is going down. And if you command a really a really tight niche, um, you can you can justify charging charging more money. But even still, it, it can be it can be tough, you know. And so I think that um, that you know that price is getting is getting less and less for people just as it gets harder for for influencers to land deals. Um, but also, I think the other side of it is we uh, most influencers don't get paid from restaurants. They'll work out uh, maybe more longer collaborations with like clothing brands and stuff like that. But um, when it comes to restaurants, like a lot of people just want to eat for free, you know, and, and that's where we were too. You know, we were working with other brands that we got paid from, but we, we just, we, we wanted to eat for free and we were willing to do something simple if it took us, you know, not very much time so we could eat. And, um, and it was fun. And so that, you know, the idea is if this platform takes a process that normally took you a few hours, and you know, streamlines it to ten minutes, then maybe that's you know you're okay eating for free. Uh, have you considered creating a different revenue model, working off of his question, where you take a percentage? Let's say an influencer wants to charge the restaurant, and they can have their listing saying two hundred dollars for an Instagram post. At that point, Foodie would take a percentage of that charge. I mean, obviously you want to gain some market traction with your free food and like the free meals and everything, but I think escalating to a charged option that you can provide influencers would create an additional revenue source for you as well. Yeah, we, we, we may do something in the future like that where like a, like a pro level or something, kind of like Airbnb has the like Lux houses or something, you know. Um, you know, we really think like the magic of, of of it though is just keeping something that's that's simple and free. It makes it just really fast, and uh, and and so when you start to charge money, it makes the process a little clunkier, a little more like 
you have to make decisions, you have to like talk to the person that writes the checks and it, it kind of like starts to take away some of the magic of it, I think. Um, so we really want to, we really want to make sure we, you know, we, we stick on that free level, but, but yeah, we, we definitely, we may have something in the future or another option like that, I think. Oh yeah. Uh, you listed four competitors. How are you guys different than those guys? So, you know, the, I mean, w with all of our competitors, we, we found that there isn't really a way to, that this process has been perfected and that it's just easy for restaurants and influencers. A lot of times, like, um, there's one company in New York that had a pretty similar idea to what we're doing, but they, um, they, uh, it, it took like two weeks between the time you wanted to eat and the time you actually could eat. And it was just like, okay, if it takes two weeks to get a free Philly cheesesteak, like for me, that's not, that's not working. That's not, <laughs> that's not what the goal, you know? Um, and they also got acquired like a year ago and now they don't do anything because the guy's just riding his paycheck out. <laughs> and, um, um, and, uh, you know, some other ones, they work with like really small people. So it's like, instead of 40,000 influencers or, or followers, you have maybe like 200 and, and you don't get a free meal, you get like a coupon, you know, you get like a free appetizer if you buy a meal. And it's just like, ah, that's still like not the vision we had, you know? Um, other, other platforms, they try and do a lot of things, right? So they'll, they'll cover all the industries and they try and cover everything. And we just think that all of those industries work so differently that if you're not niching down, you really miss um, the opportunities available in, in the restaurant sector. A potential way to maybe get more revenue out of this rather than just a free meal and to give more value to the influencers might be to ask the restaurants, instead of just giving a free meal, maybe it's a catered lunch that the influencer then can either bring other people or can drive people to that restaurant, which will bring more uh, exposure to the restaurant. And so instead of one free meal, it's like, you know, a meal for 20 people. Um, and then that becomes an event type of thing. Even if that influencer is out of state, maybe they can drive people in there and, and it's you know, more than just one meal. Maybe just yeah. Make it yeah. I think that's a good idea. Restaurants definitely express some interest in, um, having something like like a if they want to do an event like a grand opening or something they invite like a dj and a, and a few people to kind of make it a big a bigger thing so there's yeah i think maybe there's something to that love the model and the concept obviously influence marketing is huge the question that i wonder is how easy is it for, for folks to like let's say they engage you they pay you a monthly fee then all of a sudden they see oh great now i can see a dozen influencers i don't need you anymore I'll just contact those influencers, you're out of the picture. So you get one monthly fee, but now I've identified 15 or 20 folks. I just contact them one a month over the, over the next 15, 20 months directly. It seems to me like it'd be easy to cut you guys out of the picture. I don't know whether they would or not. If I were a restaurant owner, I think that thought would go through my head, is why pay 100 bucks a month? Yeah, I think that's, um, that's a good question, one we've been thinking about a lot lately because uh, I don't think we have a perfect... Uh, solution for that yet, but it, there is, you know, we only allow people to see, uh, they can see, right, you know, influencers kind of within a certain radius of them, and it, we've realized, you know, influencers kind of like move in and out of places, and they change their location a lot, and we're also constantly adding more people to the platform, so that it does help, and then to kind of like make sure you're, you're getting new people, there's also, um, Influencers can contact restaurants as well. It can go both ways. So as soon as you leave, people no longer um, will be working, you know, with you. We also, you know, we kind of hope that we can if establish some sort of um, presence here. It's free for influencers. Hopefully, if we make this process easy enough for influencers, even if restaurants talk to them on Instagram, um, influencers will say like, "Hey, we manage everything through." through foodie it's a way to keep all of my stuff in in the same place easy to manage it and um so we kind of we kind of hope to get that but but yeah mostly we're, we're just banking on the fact that uh that uh you know restaurants will will want to see the continued stream of, of influencers coming in okay one last question before we ask the one million cups question uh what's your current traction like how many restaurants you have currently signed up how many are paying a fee yeah, so we, we launched pretty, you know, we, we kind of put a little beta version out there maybe like a month and a half, two months ago. 
um, got a few, I think we would get like six restaurants signed up for free. And so then we started charging and we got, we got two paying us at like 50 bucks a month. Um, and so that's been, that's been great. You know, we're still kind of figuring out our, some of our marketing channels, how to get in touch with, with more restaurants, but got a few coming on board. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Zach. So one last question we always like to ask is, what can the One Million Cups community do for you? Oh, man. Um, I forgot to think about this question. I think, uh, um, you know, we uh, would love to, like, talk to you. If you know people that work in the restaurant industry, uh, not even for me to kind of sell them on, but it would just be super helpful for me to have connections with restaurants to pick their brain. We're always looking to talk to more restaurants and get their get their angle on things. So if you know anyone, I'd love to to connect. I have not. No. Yeah, definitely. Look into that. Thanks. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Zach. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Zach. Um, so we have an uh, announcement. Seth, if you want to come up and share more about Rev University. Sure. Rev you. Um, so Rev University is something we do the first Thursday of every month. Uh, Rev is something we do every Thursday. So um, I'm actually teaching it uh, today, this evening, from 5 to 6.30 up at Dev Mountain in Lehigh. Tomorrow it's going to be 4 to 5.30 here. And basically what it is is it's kind of a crash course, kind of a workshop on lean startup principles to help people identify and refine their early adopters and how to talk to and engage your early adopters so that you can know but basically, so that, that they can inform you on how to release your product and how to build your product and that sort of thing. So it's basically helps people gain the skills they need to in order to validate the market before you really spend very much on product development. You know, to really show to see if this is something that would work before you, you know, take any large, uh, you know, cash uh, <laughs> expenses and that sort of thing. So it's going to be uh, tomorrow from 4 to 5.30, uh, just right here at Rev Road. And I hope to see you there. It's every week. Wonderful. I've actually been to that class a couple times. Uh, the previous company I used to work with, we went in there and asked a bunch of questions, and it like changed the way that we do a lot of uh, validation for our product, and it's been pretty successful for us. So I encourage you to go to that. Um, any other announcements? Okay, we'll have our next presenter come up. Uh, literal. Um, I don't know your name, but yeah, Michael. Michael. Thanks, Michael. Come on up. Hi guys. All right, so I'm Michael. I run a company called Literal, and our goal is to make reading books as addictive as social media. So I'm going to ask you guys a question. I want you to answer with a hey, literal, okay? How many of you wish you read more books? Literal. Guys, that was terrible. Oh my gosh. Do it again louder so I can hear, so my grandma can hear it. Tell me if you wish you read more books. Hey, literal. All right, that's, that's okay. That's pretty good. Um, well, how many of you in the last six to 12 months have bought a book, started reading it, put a bookmark in it, set it down, and haven't gone back to it? Literal. All right, still pretty sad that uh, the, the, the volume there, but that's okay. It's, it was almost everyone. So you're not alone. Turns out uh, this is a very common problem. So we're going to look at Jane and Susan here. They are very similar in almost every way, except that they were born 40 years apart. If both of these were to ask their friends how many of them read for pleasure on a daily basis, the difference would be seven out of 10 in 1978 would say, yes, I read for pleasure on a daily basis versus one out of 10 in 2018. Now, if you dive into those numbers, that's an 81% decline in teen reading on a daily basis. Um, when you start asking people why they do this, the answers come back varied, but they all kind of boil down to the same thing. Uh, these are real quotes. Books smell like old people. <laughs> Books are boring. And the internet is too distracting. Ultimately, this is the one that it really boils down to, because when you dive in, what you find out is that it's not that we don't have the time to read. We have the time, but where we're spending that time is on social media. And the problem is that books have not changed in 500 years. That is it's a format that can no longer compete 
with social media. Uh, this is what folks are, this is what our brains are competing against now. Instagram, YouTube, Snapchat. These apps are designed to trigger the opioid system in your brain to make you coming back, to make you come back more and more and more. And books can't do that. These apps are beautiful, dynamic, fully interactive, they're fun, they're social, and they make great use of analytics. And so we've got data that allows these app makers to drive people back into the app. And this is why we're spending more time in social media on a daily basis and less time reading. But what's really interesting is that we actually buy more books than we ever have before. But we read way less. And the reason for that is because books, reading is aspirational. It's one of those things that you wish you did more of because your mother would be really proud if you read more books, right? Smart people read books. Um, but that's not how we do it. So social media and uh, has really changed the way that our brains think and process information. We've retrained our brains to consume media in 250 characters or less in 90 seconds of video. That's the attention span that we've given ourselves. Um, books can't compete with that, and that's the issue that we're solving. So we're going to dive in. I'm going to skip a few things here, and we're going to talk a little bit about the industry and kind of what's behind this right now. We're dealing with a $42 billion trade fiction industry, right? So fiction books, $42 billion worldwide. In the last several years, there have been $2 billion in mergers and acquisitions done in the space by big companies like Amazon, Wattpad, Rakuten, Tencent, Microsoft, and others. They are trying desperately, because this is one of the biggest areas of consumer spend worldwide, believe it or not. Um, they are trying to stay on top of two major trends in consumer behavior. And that is the trend for, from physical books to digital books. They're doing a pretty good job with that. And that is the trend from buying, from transaction based, so I'm buying a book to subscribing to a book. Okay, and they're doing a pretty good job with that. But the piece that they are missing, the piece that they're failing to compete with is the on-demand satisfaction. That is a piece that book publishers and distributors are not yet tackling. And this is where they're losing readership to social media apps that provide on-demand mental satisfaction. So what we need to do is we need to come into this with a disruptive innovation. Okay? It's not good enough to just throw the same format into a digital e-reader. Uh, that's incremental innovation, right? Or add an extra little feature into a Kindle. That doesn't quite cut it. Now there is some promise. There is an industry out there that is emerging very fast called chat fiction. How many of you have heard of chat fiction? Okay, so that's not entirely surprising, but what's very interesting is that it's huge. So there are several apps out there that put stories into a group chat format. So your characters come in as a chat message, right? So they look something like this, okay? Now the problem with these is that they're garbage. And, and uh, before I get into the garbage, let's talk a little bit about the numbers. So Hooked is one of the biggest of these apps, number one in the App Store, consistently in the top 10, over 100 million unique readers since 2015, uh, over a million dollars in monthly recurring revenue, and uh, 10 billion fictional texts read in the app. Um, if you try to run an ad on Snapchat, you can actually target chat fiction enthusiasts and get 16 million individuals. Um, this is huge. There's a ton of readers in here. But again, the problem is that the content is garbage. It's clickbaity, doesn't nourish the soul, and it's actually pretty scandalous. I don't know if you can read this, but it's essentially pornographic. And this is, this is the issue. This is what our teens and adults are reading on these days because this is what is triggering their mind. Um, and so it's the kind of garbage where they're short stories, they're written specifically for the platform, and uh, it's a horror, right? So it's, it's, you're reading the story about Jane, and she's running from this guy who's chasing her with a knife, but she's still texting you about it, you know, like giving you the live updates that she's texting. Like this is the kind of stuff that we, that we have. So that's where we come into place, okay? We are literal. We are what would happen if Snapchat and Kindle Unlimited had a baby and Jane Austen was a surrogate. Okay, that's what we do. Now let's, uh, if we can in the back, let's go ahead and jump over to that 
uh, first tab for us. And we're going to give you a little web demo. Um, so we built a we built a, a web platform. This runs. It's actually a progressive web app as well, so it's downloadable through the app stores. Uh, but this is it. It's essentially a Netflix for books. The difference is we have good books. We have real books. We take the world's best content and put it in the world's most engaging format. And what we're doing, and we have schools across the country right now that are starting to use this, and the feedback has been fantastic. So teachers are coming back to us saying, the kids that are reading this are the ones that I've never been able to get to pick up a book. When I'm showing this to people on my phone, we're in the middle of a conversation, I'll hand them uh, Pride and Prejudice, for example, and they zone out. And they will totally forget that we were in a conversation. And I have had them zone out for 10 minutes or more as they sit and read Pride and Prejudice. Right? So go ahead and jump to that next tab. Uh, let's actually look at what Pride and Prejudice looks like. There we go. Yeah. All right. So this is Pride and Prejudice. It's exactly as the author wrote it. Go ahead and tap through that. Uh, none of the content has changed. The only difference is the format. Okay, so what is not quite so obvious here is that we have implemented several things that Instagram and Snapchat and others have in implemented, things very specifically designed to trigger that opioid system in your brain, to make this an addictive experience. We've designed it in a way, oh, I haven't logged in, so it's going to prompt you to create a free account, but um, it's specifically designed in a way that allows you to jump into a book uh, we call it the toilet test when you're a developer, right? So you sit on the toilet, you can jump into a book, and then you can jump out of the book, and you still feel like you got something done, okay? That's what we do. So our whole goal is to drive this addictive nature. So the idea is that we can't get people off their phones. But what we can do is we can make that screen time much more valuable and much more wholesome, and that's the goal here. Um, all right, go ahead and jump back to those slides, and we'll kind of dive through the rest. There we go. So uh, we are, we have essentially a Netflix model, um, pay a monthly subscription fee and get access to unlimited reading. And uh, you'll get access to different levels of books. So you can get the classics, you can get uh, content from independent authors, new publishers, uh, as well as from the big publishers as well. Uh, traction to date, so we are uh, actually very close on track to finishing our Google for Education partnership. Uh, we got $20,000 from them. Uh, at South by Southwest to uh, continue to build this. Uh, we've done primary research with 81 educators. We, we've been testing this since September. We started with a, some really cheap, quick and dirty uh, user mockups. We actually took Romeo and Juliet and we created fake Facebook accounts for all the characters and then we got them all in on a Facebook chat and actually manually wrote out the first scene of the book and that's what we were handing to people saying, would you read this? And uh, so we got some great feedback from that. And so we then built a quick and dirty PHP version and built, tested some more features. And uh, so we took that to a conference in November, a Utah English teachers conference. We thought maybe English teachers would be interested in this. And in four hours, we pre-registered 27,000 students through their educators, right? So we can get teachers very excited. We went to South by Southwest, the EDU conference, uh, and did essentially the same thing. We got about another 130,000 uh, pre-registered students through those educators that way. Um, so we have, let's see, where else am I at here? Uh, we've got uh, some awards when Google's Startup Weekend. Um, we have some clients that have purchased annual licenses uh, from us. We've got some cool partnerships going on with uh, Story Shares, which is a publisher that they've got one title on right now. They're bringing on another 12 here in the next two weeks. And they have 400 titles in total that they're hoping to bring onto the platform. We've got another deal with uh, our first independent author who's going to bring in some uh, exclusive titles for us uh, named C.T. Walsh and his Middle School Mayhem series. And so we're working closely with those guys to create the process for bringing on additional publishers and additional uh, authors and content onto the platform. Um, we've got uh, several schools that we're working with right now. There's a video testimonial from one of our schools down in Austin, Texas. 
Um, and that's really it. So we are uh, in the fundraising process. Uh, well, we're, we're getting started with that. We're, uh, we've now got a beta that's out in the world. And so that's what we're doing is just driving traction. Um, but that's really it. So uh, our goal, again, is to make reading super addictive. And we're literal. The end. All right, lay it on me. What kind of questions do you have? Uh, the other people that are doing this are creating unique content. You guys are essentially just copying the content. Uh, is there any copyright infringement issues? What, what's the risk associated there? Do you have to pay for licensing? How does that work? Yeah, great question. So we started with public domain titles to test the concept, right? So we can load up tons of public domain titles really easy. And now we are going through the process of working together with the publishers and the authors to get uh, to access their content. So the way it works is that these publishers, uh, they pay us to get their content onto the platform. Um, they can, and then we pay them uh, based on, so we take a portion of our revenue each month and we divvy that out. So if 10% uh, went to your publishing house and 20% went to yours, we pay that out accordingly. And so this is a way for authors and publishers to distribute their content. And what's really cool about Literal is it allows them to reach an audience that they otherwise would not be able to find, right? Because these are the folks that don't consider themselves readers. These are the folks that don't generally have the time to read. They don't like, they're intimidated when they open a 400 page book and they get 30 pages in and see they still have 370 pages left to go, right? Literal is reaching a completely different audience, which helps widen the potential reach for publishers and authors. How many uh, books do you have on the platform right now? And also, if they get in now, do they have a better chance of getting, gaining popularity? Yes. Uh, so we have roughly 40 books that are live. We have about um, probably another 60 to 70 or so that are under development right now. Uh, we built a tool on the back end, and this is actually where the cool patents come into place uh, in the intellectual properties. So we've got a tool that basically lets us hit upload on an ebook and it automatically spits it out into this format. Uh, what it doesn't automatically do yet is say, you know, it'll say, hey, this is a narrator, this is a speaker, this is a different speaker, but it doesn't say this is Jane, this is John, this is Susan. And so we have editors that run through that do that. And we built that system out in a way that we can tap into the work from home space. Uh, we can tap into the, we can allow the editors, or excuse me, we can allow the publishers and the authors to be able to go in and publish their own content, manage their own content, um, or they can pay us to do that, so. Is there an opportunity, um, or maybe you've already thought of this, but is there a way for the actual reader to go in and say, hey, I, I really like this, but I like it so much. Is there a link to where I can get the ebook or I can actually order the book off Amazon or whatever? Obviously, that has much greater uh, attraction for, for publishers and for authors, you know, that they could actually start making revenue from that standpoint as well for those that are really interested in their work. Or obviously, well, I really like this, and the guy's written maybe like a Rick Riordan for kids who's written... 30 books, so there's maybe a way for them to go, okay, I can look at all the other books he's written, maybe order some of those as well. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that authors are telling us they're really interested in, and this is the piece that we're in the process of building out right now, is um, for authors, they see this as a way for them to communicate directly with their audience, right? So, so to answer your question, yes, users will be able to go out and purchase hardback paperback books of the copies that they like here, right? And we do that a lot with Audible. I don't, I'm sure a lot of you guys listen to Audible. I'll listen to a book on Audible. If I really like it, I'll then go out and buy the hard copy, right? Same sort of deal here, right? This is a format that works for us in certain parts of our lives, but there are times that we just want a hardback. Um, and then real quick, there was, so the authors want to be able to communicate with their audience. And so that's a platform that we're building out. They can have these live chats. They can get feedback on the books that they're publishing. We currently allow you to upload a book, and you can publish just the first chapter and serialize your entire book. So you can get feedback on the first chapter, make changes to the second, third chapter, publish that. As I spit everywhere, I apologize. Uh, and then they can publish that and get feedback. So for authors, it's a great tool to interact with 
and improve their craft. So, yeah. I was going to ask you, talk to me a little bit about languages. Uh, obviously, this is in English. Talk to me about what your plans are for other than English in the future and your footprint going globally. Yeah, multilingual for sure uh, and globally is, is where we see this going. So the nice thing about this is at its core, there's three pages involved in the app, right? You've got the browse page, you've got the title summary page, and you've got the reader page. Right, we've got a, a builder on the back end, but uh, it's pretty simple. And so for us to be able to add support for multiple languages, um, pretty straightforward to do. And that's absolutely on the roadmap. Uh, we'll probably, we, there's, there's, we're looking at Spanish, there's other um, non-Latin based languages that we're looking at going into uh, first. But we have a lot of interest from uh, English language learning centers uh, across the US. So my co-founder is in Barcelona. Uh, this idea generated while I was living in Barcelona along with him. Um, we were actually, it was 3 a.m. and we were driving to Pamplona to go run with the bulls. And he, he leans over and he says, dude, I, I've had this idea and I, I've not been able to put it down. And uh, he told me and it was just, it was genius. So, and I was in the middle of raising a private equity fund at the time and uh, essentially said, all right, this is where I need to be, so. You want to jump back to that reader page? So you're, you'll just like kind of scroll, and as you're going down, the different characters' um, dialogue will like pop in. Is that how it how it goes? That's exactly right. Yeah. So okay. you'll see your narrator on the right, and you'll see your characters come up on the left. Very okay. similar to if you were in a group chat, right? Where you're coming up on the right, everyone else is coming in on the left. It's a format that we're really familiar with. Um, and you'll notice right there, that's a really big speech bubble. So one of the things we are learning from our user testing is how big these speech bubbles need to be. And these are actually really important. One of the consistent bits of feedback that we get from users who use this is that they feel that they read faster and that they understand more of the book. We thought that was a really weird comment to get, but as we started digging into it, one of the things that this resolves is what's called the F-shape reading pattern, okay? When you look at a page, you read pretty thoroughly that first full line and then you get maybe three quarters of the way through the next line, right? And then you're just basically skimming the first, the left-hand side of the page. And so your comprehension goes down. Um, and this eliminates that because it, it breaks up that content into more of these bite-sized chunks. The same thing that we're doing when we're reading Twitter and going through Instagram posts. Yeah. Yeah. So it's been fun going through this process because when we, especially when we were building out the content engine, is what we call it, where you hit upload and it spits it out. Uh, authors are they're a crazy breed, right? They like to do things with the English language that you're not supposed to do, and uh, that doesn't make our job super easy. But um, so when they're throwing out you know, these weird poems with these weird formattings, yeah, there are some times that it gets a little wonky. But what we've built in is the ability to do other things other than just speech bubbles, right? So you can't throw in just plain text. You can throw in images. Uh, we're going to be rolling out a feature here where you can change that whole background image, right? So if you're in a scary haunted house, you can show a scary haunted house in the background. Um, there are other things that you can do. Um, the other thing that we have gotten feedback on is uh, well, anyways, I, I digress, so I won't go in there. So th this is cool. I'm curious uh, on two things. First of all, to know what percentage of people actually read the whole book, because um, I feel like I'm less likely maybe to read this. It, it seems kind of novel, like maybe I'll just, no, no pun intended, maybe I'll just like, uh, you know, go through and read the first couple chats and then be like, oh, you know, this isn't a format that I, you know, I don't, I don't really want to read a 400 page book in a format like this, do I? And so I'm curious, are people really reading the entire books in this format and finding it more, y you know, better? Um, and then my second question is, all these people who already do the chat fiction, can't they just do the same thing? Is are, You can't be the first person to have put Pride and Prejudice in a chat format. So are you, you know, are you unique and what keeps other people from doing the exact same thing if they already have, you know, two million people on their, 
uh, you know, on their platform, why are you guys even unique? So those are kind of my two questions. Yeah, both great questions. So for the first one, are people reading through the whole books? Uh, the answer is yes. So I say that because what we're, we're, we're brand new. So we've just sort of, we've just rolled this out into the public. And so the whole goal right now, our whole the whole big thing that we're working on is on building up the traction that we need to take to investors to say, hey, people are reading the whole book. Or they're, you know, even if they're not reading the whole book, we know right now that in a paperback, you read on average 30 pages into a book before you put it down and you never touch it again. But if we can go to publishers and say, with our format, people will read 50 pages into a book before they throw it down, even that is a big win, right? It's more engagement. So the answer is, what we've seen with the very little bit of user, uh, uh, of users that we have is that they are reading a lot more. We don't know the final answer. The second question was what keeps us unique? So the biggest deal is going to be our relationship with the publishers and the authors, right? If we sign those guys on, they can't go to Hooked. They can't go to these other guys, right? Um, we will do kind of the same model that Netflix did, right? Where in the beginning, they're licensing other content and they can't get that content on any other platform. And ultimately, we hope to be bringing in more exclusive titles, right? Like we're doing with C.T. Walsh and uh, we've got some deals with some other authors that we're working on. So that's the big goal right there, is those relationships that we can build. Okay, one last question and then we'll, we'll move on. No, go ahead. Okay, I was yeah. just wondering, can you tag it at all? So say like, again, just a, well, whoever the author is, but can it be like, and you'll see it done in some books to where you're like reading the book and there'll be like an asterisk and it'll actually show where that happened in another book or maybe where you can tag it and say, hey, the book previous to this is X and the book post of this is X. I think some of those things to just again, to get the, the authors really behind it and say, wow, there's an opportunity here for me to not only sell this book, but obviously everything else within the genre as well. Yeah, so the, definitely it's something we've talked about doing, and I think it is, it's far down on our backlog right now. Um, but one of the pieces that is kind of related to that is because we've had so much interest from English language learning centers and teachers is the ability to click on a word and get the definition, right? So that's one thing that we can do. <clears throat> it's not currently built in there, but, uh, but that's closer to being done. Uh, than what you're talking about. We have talked about adding footnotes and some other things. So there's a lot of things that you can do. Right now, and I think someone alluded to it, right now we are working with fiction because this format works really, really well with narrative fiction. Um, but the whole, one of the big wins that we can get out of this is in mastering that content engine and the AI responsible for looking through a text and being able to understand who is speaking. Okay, this may seem trivial, but this is something that DARPA and many, many schools, big Berkeley, Harvard, MIT, have spent thousands and thousands and perhaps millions of dollars in trying to figure this out, right? Because how great would it be for the CIA, right, to be able to upload a text and find out exactly which terrorist to go after, right? The, the uses for that technology go far beyond fiction. And that's what we have here the, the folks that we have talked to that are on our board, uh, our advisory board, that deal with that very issue of extracting characters from literary fiction, it's a weird thing to focus on, but they do it. Uh, they tell us the biggest problem is there's no training platform right now. There's not enough content out there to train an AI to be able to do this. And this allows us to be able to accomplish that. So. Hey, awesome, thank you so much. So our last question is, what can we as a One Million Cups community do for you? Cool, so for us right now, the biggest thing is uh, driving up traction um, in terms of actual users. So I encourage all of you to go to literalapp.com and sign up. And I encourage you to post about it on social media, share it with your friends, get them to sign up. Um, that's, that's really where we're at right now. So let's awesome. build it. Awesome. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to thank both of our presenters today. The, both great. Um, literal came up to us. Uh, we had one presenter drop out, so that was just on the fly. 
um, today. So thank you for doing that. Um, if you have an idea that you want to present or a startup or something you're working on, please reach out to us. Um, you can go to uh, um, to One Million Cups Provo and submit there, or you can reach out to one of us uh, organizers and we'll help you out with that. Um, and then if you have anybody that you think that would like to do that, please reach out to them and continue bringing more people because um, we appreciate the, the community and being able to help out with everyone else around with what they're working on. So I uh, guess we'll see you guys next week. Thank you.